All right, welcome to our webinar today on apples for Colorado below 7,000 feet in elevation. We're going to adjust the mic just a little bit here. Um, is it the volume at the top? Anyway, I'll keep doing my introductions and we're, we're going to play with So I'll direct your attention to the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. It's the chat box. So if you're new to webinars, this is the place that you can communicate with us. So as you have questions or comments throughout Joel's presentation, then you can type them there, and Joel will probably address them at the end of the presentation. So we'll have plenty of time for question and answer at the end. Um, Ruth, can you bring up the poll question? So right before I turn things over to Joel, let's just um, rate everyone's knowledge on growing trees. So use your mouse and just go ahead and click the answer that's most appropriate for you, and we'll give, her, give everyone a few seconds to do that. So it looks like pretty much everyone's thinking some knowledge or maybe no knowledge, and a few people are pretty knowledgeable. So good. Um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Joel. Great. Thanks, Jennifer, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful lunch break. Um, so today we're going to talk about apples, and uh, I think this is a pretty auspicious time and season to be talking about apples because, uh, as I bet a bunch of you have noticed, this has been a great year for apples. Uh, it's really been a great year for most tree fruits, but um, I'm right in the middle of Honeycrisp harvest right now. We've already picked Macintosh and Yellow Transparent, and so uh, anyways, pretty exciting year for apples. There we go. Okay, so I just thought I'd start off with a, a couple of pictures um, of this year's apples. Um, I do feel like it's always important to remind you guys why you should bother listening to me. Uh, I got to show you that I can actually do this stuff before you should take my, my advice. So anyways, uh, on the upper left you see a Macintosh, lower left is a whole bin of Macintosh, uh, kind of strange yellowy color there. I think that's just the, the camera. Uh, and then over on the right are some Honeycrisp apples, um, which like I said, we are picking right now. And I will just point out, um, this year, as you may have noticed, is just early for everything. Uh, we had such a mild spring and no frosts after really the, the second week of March. And so our growing season started about three weeks early this year. And so uh, this year, all of our varieties, whether it's apples or other fruits, have been ripening up about three weeks early. Um, so for any of you who've planted things like Red Delicious or Brayburn, some of those late ripening apples that often are still green when we get a hard frost, um, you should have good success with those this year because they'll ripen in time. Okay, so uh, the key concepts, and, and you kind of think of this almost as the outline we're going to go through today. Um, first of all, you can grow apples on the front range. I know there are a lot of people who feel kind of iffy about that or they don't see any commercial farms growing apples over here, so they think it can't be done, but absolutely can. Now, the flip side of that is there are challenges, let's be honest and face up to it, but today I'm going to talk about what those challenges are and how to get around them, and I think there's pretty effective uh, ways to manage all of those challenges. And I do want to point out, there used to be commercial orchards here on the, the front range, and I guess I'm speaking to people who are all over the state, um, but I just want to point out, even though uh, it is kind of commonly thought of as the Palisade Grand Junction area is, you know, the fruit growing region of our state, um, let me put it like this, it is the most ideal fruit growing region of our state, but you can have success uh, certainly with apples in many, many, many other parts of the state, and we have a history of that, and, and really the thing that changed that had more to do with marketing and nationwide refrigerated transportation than it really did with where you can and can't grow things. Um, it, when, when we had uh, uh, refrigerated freight cars and the interstate highway system, it allowed our society to just bring all of our commercial fruit production to the west coast largely where things are conditions are ideal 
and then ship that fruit wherever you want to go. Uh, and that kind of dried up a lot of the, the markets in lots of places around our country that absolutely can grow fabulous apples. And just one other thing I'll, I'll point out about uh, the fabulous apples we can grow here in Colorado. Um, if you think about places that are real famous for apples, for instance, Washington State over on the, the east side of the Cascades there, a big part of it is the relatively dry climate with warm daytime summer temperatures and relatively cool nighttime temperatures. You know, a big difference between your nighttime and uh, daytime temperature. That really helps get a lot of those sugars developed in your fruits. And so we share that same kind of thing here. Of course, the challenge is we tend to have late frosts that they largely avoid there in eastern Washington. But as far as, you know, as long as we get our, our uh, trees through the frost, we tend to grow very, very good fruit. Um, okay, so success is going to involve the, the following items here. You're going to have to have good site selection. You're going to have to grow appropriate cultivars. Um, also, you should be grafting or buying trees that have been grafted onto appropriate rootstocks. Um, and you're going to want to have genetic diversity in the varieties of apples that you're growing. Um, also, you will have to have active pest and disease management. And this is something I know a lot of people uh, have the kind of Garden of Eden concept where they're going to plant a bunch of fruit trees and then they'll just be able to walk around in their garden and pick fruit and it's going to be this this wonderful thing that doesn't require a lot of work and I, I'm all about setting realistic expectations and I do want you to know that if you want to grow good apples whether it's organic or conventional you will have to be taking an active role as a, as a pest and disease manager. Um, I also really strongly recommend that you buy bare root trees and I'll talk a little bit about pruning uh, near the end of the presentation. Okay, so what makes a good site for an apple tree? And, and this generally goes for, for all fruit trees that we grow around here. Um, a big part of it has to do with topography and the way that uh, cold air and warm air flows uh, along and, and uh, across those landscapes. And so the big thing, I mean, you could, there's a lot of detail in these, these images here, but the big thing is you want to be on a slope. You don't want to be at the very top of a slope. You don't want to be at the very bottom of a slope. Tops and bottoms of slopes are where cold air uh, is going to have the, the biggest impact, and it kind of hangs around there uh, for the longest. Whereas on a slope, uh, that cold air tends to drain away down to the bottom of the hill where it settles, um, and uh, typically the, the frost pressure is much, much less on a slope. And if you look around at places that do have commercial orchards in this state and elsewhere, you'll find that's a very common theme is that you'll find them on sh sloping, uh, sloping topography. And notice I put on there a 10 to 20 degree Fahrenheit difference is not uncommon. And when I say that, that's from, you know, mid slope to the bottom of the slope. It, it's kind of amazing how cold air functions much like uh, water does, right? Hydrodynamics are very similar um, to, to air flow dynamics. Okay, so of course the whole reason that that is such a big deal is because here in Colorado, as I think you all know, we are rather prone to having some late and rather unpredictable spring frosts. This year, of course, we really didn't, uh, but that's mm, kind of an unusual year. This picture here is showing us what we're trying to avoid by all this site placement it is frost damage on an apple bud. And so if you look, you know, that bud has been dissected and cut right through the middle. And if you look near the top, you see all of those kind of pale cream yellow anthers. Those are the, the male uh, portions of the flower that produce the pollen. But then right in the middle, you see those, those, that brown kind of twisted stalk. That is the female portion. It's called the style. Up at the tip is the stigma, which is where the pollen actually lands and, and pollination uh, is accomplished. And then the pollen travels down those, that brown tube down into the base of the flower where actual fertilization occurs. So if you have a flower bud like this and the frost has damaged that style and stigma, um, you are not going to get fruit. So this is what you want to look for. For instance, after you've had a frost during bloom season or when the buds are, are not yet open and you're wondering, hey, did that frost last night or that cold weather event 
did it damage my trees? Uh, did it damage my blossoms and my potential crop this year? This is what you'll be looking for. So you can go out, uh, usually I like to leave about 24 hours for the discoloration to happen, and then go out into your, your tree or orchard and uh, dissect a couple of buds, and that's, that's what you're looking for there. Uh, hopefully, the good news is when you see that and it's green, and it looks like a nice healthy green all the way from, from tip to base. Okay, so another thing about selecting a good site is going to be the pH of the soil. And, you know, this is probably in some ways old news for many of you Colorado gardeners. We all deal with the fact that in most parts of our state, we've got slightly alkaline soils. Um, fortunately, apple trees are not nearly as susceptible to pH, high pH stresses as things like maple trees, for instance, and some oaks, um, or even plum trees. Plums and peaches are more sensitive, but apples can still get stressed out um, by high pH. And of course, the, the, the issue there is that at, at those higher pHs, uh, it can be difficult for plants to take up certain nutrients that may be plenty available in the soil and specifically uh, the ones they have issues with is first going to be iron and then to a lesser degree phosphorus and so the picture I'm showing there uh, shows that kind of pale green apple leaf and you can see how the veins even the, the small veins are still a pretty healthy green but it's the tissues in between veins that is turning almost yellowish. Um, we refer to that as intervenal chlorosis and that is the classic symptom of iron deficiency. So ideally um, you, you really don't want to plant a, a tr an apple tree anywhere where the soil is above 7.5. Above 7.5 you're going to have a very hard time combating these iron deficiencies. Uh, below 7.5 you can manage it pretty well. Um, I'd say anywhere that you've got a soil that's about 7.2 up to 7.5 you will definitely want to be in the habit of using chelated iron. And notice in the kind of third blurb there, uh, it says easily managed up to pH 7.5 with use of chelated iron. That's how you spell it and pronounce it. Uh, you may find that some people at garden centers aren't familiar with it, but uh, it's a pretty commonly carried product. Most chelated iron products come with uh, an array of other micronutrients. You can get it in both a granular or a liquid concentrate form. Um, either way is just fine. So anyways, you want to watch out for that. You want to try and avoid those problems ahead of time by planting in soils with pHs, ideally uh, from about 6.6 6 up to 7.2. That's going to be the, the happy zone for most apples. Okay, now another thing about uh, selecting a good site, and this is, this is something that um, we can take advantage of as homeowners, as gardeners, for those of you out there who are thinking of having, you know, a few trees rather than having acres and acres of orchards, is actually playing with um, the, the sun and the shadow and the way that that changes uh, in different parts of your yard, for instance. Um, and so the diagram or the, the illustration that I show here um, shows, you know, something I think you're probably familiar with. In the winter, uh, the sun is lower in the sky. And of course, in the summer, on June 21st is when it's highest in the sky. So that means that if, and it's always coming from more or less from the south. So that means that if you were to plant a tree to the north of your house, um, that if it's at a certain distance from the house, and you can do a little bit of basic trigonometry to figure out exactly where that should be, um, it will stay in shade during the winter, and then it will be in full sun during the growing season. And you might be wondering, well, why the heck is he telling us this? Here's the deal. Uh, I mentioned before, late spring frosts are probably the biggest challenge we face here. The reason being that all of our fruit trees are pretty early bloomers compared to a lot of other you know, ornamental trees and such. Um, and so a lot of those late spring frosts will damage the flowers when they're in bloom or have not yet quite opened. Uh, fortunately, apples bloom later than a lot of other tree fruits, such as apricots, peaches, uh, plums, nectarines. But they still get frosted out in some years. So back to this slide here, um, one of the things that causes these trees to come out of dormancy, of course, is going to be the temperature uh, as things warm up in the spring. And I know a lot of us, because we spend all of our time above ground, we tend to think about air temperatures. And while that is important for trees as far as their determination of when they're going to come out of dormancy, it turns out that the temperature in their root zone down in the soil is also really important as far as triggering those kinds of decisions for the tree. And so by planting a tree in a place where it will stay shaded and, the, and its root zone will stay shaded all the way until, say, May 1st, 
and then the sun creeps up over the roof and now it's got full sun all during the season. That's just one way that you can actually uh, buy yourself a little bit of um, protection from those frosts because you will find that a tree planted where it's shadowed, its roots are shadowed all winter, will come out of dormancy a little bit later than a tree that's planted someplace where its root zone uh, is in sun all winter. Because of course, remember, we do get a lot of sun, a lot of intense sun here in the, in the winter time, and it's easy for those soils to warm up. Um, so that's just a little trick there. Uh, again, you can utilize that in a small garden situation. I have yet to see uh, an orchard scenario where they plant a house and then a tree and then a house and then a tree just for that. For that I don't think it would be economically feasible. Okay, so let's talk about appropriate cultivars. And some of you may be more familiar with the term variety, but uh, in vocab-wise, cultivar and variety may mean exactly the same thing. So because of our tendency for late frosts, and because we can have hard frosts again in the fall, as early as really mid-September is not an unusual time, we're looking for cultivars that are going to be relatively late blooming and relatively early ripening. And so that does limit, uh, of, of all the, you know, there's 2,000 plus varieties of apples out there in the world. Uh, that does limit us quite a bit, but when you're starting from a pool of 2,000, that means that there are still, in my opinion, and this hasn't been determined 100% yet, but my best uh, sense is that there's probably a couple hundred varieties of apples that are quite well suited to growing uh, here in Colorado. Um, you're also going to want to look for cultivars that have disease resistance. And... Uh, this is something you're probably familiar with from picking out which tomatoes you're going to grow. You know, if you've got bad problems with a particular disease, you're going to pick varieties that are, have at least some resistance to that. Uh, you can do the same thing with apples. And we'll talk about diseases a little bit more, but basically the one disease that is foremost here in Colorado when it comes to growing apples is fire blight. Um, there's a bunch of other diseases that apples get that we do not have problems with here. For instance, apple scab. If you go to the Midwest or especially to the East Coast, growers there have horrendous problems controlling apple scab. It's a fungus. Um, it is the key disease, and, and all of their practices are basically based around their management program for scab. Well, our luxury is we don't have to deal with it. We have fire blight. And so fire blight's going to be the thing you're looking for varieties that are resistant to fire blight. There's no such thing as a tree or a variety that is immune to fire blight, but there are now some with very strong resistance to fire blight. Um, and then finally, as far as an appropriate cultivar, you got to think about the end use. Um, what is it that you're growing apples for? Are you growing them for fresh eating and for sale at a market? Are you growing apples for baking or for drying or for making cider? Um, and there are specific types of apples that are used to make all of those different end products. So it's good to know before you choose varieties, you know, what is your intended end use for the, the produce? Okay, so I'd just like to give you a list of some suggested cultivars. And as I mentioned before, and you'll see I've got a little note at the bottom right of the screen here, I, I truly do believe that there are a couple hundred more varieties that are good for our region. We just need to evaluate them. And uh, fortunately, I've, I've started that progress or process on a bit of a small scale. Uh, just this spring, I planted out a trial orchard with uh, 115 trees in it, most of which are apples. We've got about 18 varieties out there. And so I'll just be evaluating those. They're ones that I think uh, there's a good likeliness that they'll be appropriate for us. And I'm just going to evaluate them over the next several years. And, and uh, you can check in with me for, for research updates uh, as that work goes on. But um, notice here, I've got a list of University of Minnesota releases. Uh, University of Minnesota is one of the, the big and, and kind of, I would say, most important uh, apple breeding programs in our country these days, especially for folks like us in Colorado. Because in Minnesota, the traits that they're looking for are similar traits to what we're looking for. Things that will bloom late, that will ripen early. Uh, they do have fire blight there, so they're looking for things with fire blight resistance. And they are primarily breeding for fresh market or eating apples. So crunchy and sweet. Uh, you're probably familiar with Honeycrisp. You see I've got it circled there. Um, Honeycrisp has taken the apple world by storm lately. It's a great apple. It did come out of University of Minnesota. And I will just point out that in, in the last you know, six years that I've been back here in Colorado, I have not found a better suited cultivar of apple uh, for, for our climate and, and area. Um, 
It's a late bloomer, relatively. Uh, it also ripens early. This year, like I said, we've already been picking Honeycrisp. We started picking Honeycrisp around the 14th of August. Most years, you're starting around the first week of September and finishing up picking in the second week of September, but uh, that still gets us in before a frost in pretty much every year. Um, another thing about the Honeycrisps is they do have quite good fire blight resistance. Um, so that's just uh, one to consider there. I think it's nice that such a great tasty apple also happens to be one that's well suited uh, for our area. And then you can see a number of other uh, cultivars there. Uh, Cornell University in New York State has also developed a lot of apples that do have good kind of northern tier cold state uh, tolerances. <clears throat> and then some others over on the right hand side. And I, I really hope that over the next coming a uh, couple of years I will be able to expand this list for you quite a bit but uh, all the ones on the list now are, are apples that you'll have uh, quite good success with um, speaking of which you know I do just want to point out uh, quite good success with growing fruits here in Colorado means that you get a crop four years out of five okay that's going to be quite good success but because of those late spring frosts we just never know when a really freakish uh, frost is going to come right during bloom season um, so anyways just something to consider and actually, before I go ahead, I just want to point out that um, <clears throat> I mentioned genetic diversity up at the top of the presentation. And so when you have a frost, um, typically here when we have those late spring frosts, it's going to happen for one night. Maybe we have two nights in a row where we get a, a cold front that comes through and we have those frosts. But if you've got a diverse assortment of apple cultivars, they're all going to bloom at slightly different times. And... Uh, if the blooms are still closed on one variety and they're open on another when that frost event happens, you will probably still get fruit that year on the ones with the flowers closed. The flowers open, you know, you'll prob they'll, they'll get damaged and you probably will get no or very little crop on those trees. And so by having staggered bloom times, um, all of relatively mid to late blooming apples, uh, that's another way to essentially diversify your portfolio and reduce risk that you will get all of your apple blossoms wiped out in any one season. <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk about rootstocks for just a second, and I'll just put in a little plug here um, because I am going to do a one-hour uh, lunchtime webinar just on rootstocks um, on September 10th. Um, but I just want to touch on a little bit here because a lot of people think, put a lot of thought into what varieties or cultivars of apples they're going to grow, and they put zero thought into what kind of rootstock. And it actually turns out to be really important for your likelihood of success. So just for those of you who aren't familiar, um, pretty much all fruit trees these days, and for many decades now, have been grafted, where the desired variety of fruit, your cultivar, uh, is the top portion, or what we call the scion, and it is grafted onto a root system of a different variety. Um, in this case, it, with apples, usually it's a type of apple or a crab apple. Um, and the rootstock variety is selected for having a really tough uh, disease and, and soil problem tolerant uh, ability to, to work really well in challenging situations. Um, and it pairs that great strength with the, the nice kind of fruit that we'd like developed on the top. It turns out if we planted most of these cultivars of apples that we like, if we planted them and grew them on their own roots, they would just be much, much more susceptible to root diseases, to winter damage to the roots, uh, etc. So grafting is really important, and the, the types of rootstocks are very, very important. Okay, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more, but I, I do suggest that you consider rootstock. And uh, it can be very frustrating because most nurseries, uh, certainly nurseries around here in Colorado, when you buy fruit trees there, they don't usually tell you, and it's not usually labeled what rootstock it's on. Um, I'll just point out, too, that the rootstock is going to determine whether your tree is a dwarf, a semi-dwarf, or a full-size tree. And that's a pretty important thing to know if you've got a spot in mind to plant your tree. You know, is this thing going to get 8 feet tall, or is it going to get 35 feet tall and 35 feet wide? So uh, rootstock selection, very important. It becomes even more important when you're in a place like Colorado, which is kind of marginal, where we've got some of these climatic and soil challenges. You really want to select the right rootstock, okay? And so <clears throat> this slide here, I'm just showing you some of the, the suggested rootstocks that I have found 
uh, work best here in our soils. And I've got them arranged from top to bottom, smallest to largest. And you can see in parentheses, I put a, a height there. That is the height at maturity. So figure after about you know, 10 or 15, even 20 years, this is going to be the height of that tree. So notice the first one there, M27, um, it's going to result in a super dwarfed tree, only three to four feet at maturity. It really makes more of an apple bush, um, and it doesn't have particularly strong roots. Um, just like the rootstock dwarfs the above ground part of the, the tree, the root system is also dwarfed. Um, so really the only implication there is that you'll need to stake this tree because the wind has a has a uh, likelihood to topple them over or at least tilt them. Um, you know, in that M27, nobody's going to use that in a commercial orchard, but it does make for a really neat kind of novelty uh, apple bush um, in a, a backyard or garden scenario. Uh, the next two are really a couple of my very favorite root stocks because they are fully dwarfing. If you look, both of them are going to result in trees that are about eight feet tall, you know, maybe 10 feet tall. Um, but that just, of course, makes things very easy when it comes to management of your tree, whether it's pruning, spraying, harvesting, etc. you're never going to have to get onto a ladder, and that makes a world of difference. Um, the Bud 9 has been around for a while, and kind of interesting story. During the Cold War, of course, you know, we didn't share any kind of scientific information with the Soviet Union and vice versa, and so they actually developed a whole bunch of rootstocks over there because they didn't have access to rootstocks we were developing. And it turns out that so much of Central Asia, uh, parts of Russia, are very similar to our climate and soils that we have here in Colorado. And so some of their uh, rootstock releases have turned out to be really great selections for us. Probably the best being Bud 9. Um, again, a fully dwarfing tree. It has resistance to fire blight, and it's extremely cold hardy. Uh, and for all of those reasons, I, I have that as one of my top picks uh, for rootstock for apples here in Colorado. Uh, coming next is G16. Uh, now G16, um, oh, let me just back up to the Bud 9. Occasionally you will see that one listed as B9, or sometimes it'll use, they'll use the full name, which is Budgovsky 9. Uh, so as you're looking in catalogs, just realize that one goes by all three of those, those terms. Uh, so the next one there, G16, that is a much more recently developed rootstock. It comes out of Cornell University. The G stands for Geneva, uh, as in Geneva, New York, where they have a, a research and breeding station. And uh, again, it's a full dwarf. And this one has, notice on Bud 9, I said that it's fire blight resistant. Well, G16 has strong fire blight resistance. Um, the G series of rootstocks that they've developed there in Cornell is the first series of apple rootstocks that was specifically developed to have very strong fire blight resistance. In all of these other rootstocks, uh, we sometimes have fire blight resistance, but it kind of occurred as happenstance. With the Geneva series, they, that was the specific goal of their breeding program. Um, the next one down, uh, oh, I will mention on G16, it can be a little bit difficult to find right now because it's so new that a lot of nurseries are in the pr process of adopting that and growing out their stock. Um, certainly for garden scale, um, you'll be able to find it no problem. If you're ordering hundreds and hundreds of trees, that's where it can become a bit of an issue. And certainly just a kind of a general comment on uh, you know ordering fruit trees. If you want to get picky, if you want just the exact cultivar that you want or that I've recommended to you, um, you want to place your orders early in the winter. Uh, November is not too early to place orders with these nurseries, and that's when you're going to get the best selection. Uh, so real quick, M26, I think it's important that you, uh, that you know about this one because it is by far the most important uh, dwarfing, fully dwarfing rootstock out there. It's the most common. However, it has really no resistance to fire blight. And so we tend to see trees on M26 have fire blight problems at some point in their life. And again, it, the problem can come in on the rootstock. And I think many of you may be familiar with fire blight symptoms in the crown and the canopy of the tree, but a rootstock infection can really take out a tree very quickly. So I do not recommend M26. And again, this is going to be a, a really good reason to order your trees from a specialty nursery that will tell you what rootstock it's on, rather than going to certainly like a, one of the big box stores, uh, I can guarantee you they never know. Um, I've even tried contacting the nurseries they order their trees from, and they're like, heck, we don't know. We just throw a bunch of our cheapest trees on a truck and send it to the box stores. So 
good luck, grab bag. <laughs> um, next, you'll see G11. That's also one of those Geneva. Again, great fire blight resistance. And that's going to produce just a little bit bigger dwarf tree than its, than its cousin, the G16. Uh, then you see G30. Again, 12 feet tall, just a little bit bigger. We're getting now into kind of semi-dwarf territory. Um, and then M7. M7 is a semi-dwarf tree. It's really the rootstock that our West Slope apple orchard industry is, is built on. Uh, that's the, the prevalent rootstock over there. And that's one of those ones that turned out just by happenstance to actually have quite good fire blight resistance. Um, the only problem we see around it with it here is sometimes we'll see a little bit of root damage from cold injury in particularly cold winters, but it's not really ever enough to kill the trees. Um, so probably not a, a real serious concern. And then the last one I have down there, the MM106, that is there primarily uh, for people who want that bigger tree that's gonna get you know 16 to 18 feet tall. It still won't be a full size tree, but if you want that apple for the yard that's gonna cast some shade and be that big apple tree, um, that's a really good rootstock. Uh, to use around here, although it can have fire blight problems, and there's just not um, there's not a rootstock that's going to grow a tree that size that is immune or has real strong resistance to fire blight yet at this point. Okay, so um, like I mentioned before, I do think it's really important to have realistic expectations, okay? So given the spring weather, frost damage should be expected in some years. Um, and I just wanted to point out, though, look at these pictures. Uh, upper left, you know, we can see some pink apple buds with snow sitting on them. If you see that, do not necessarily give up hope immediately. Um, just because there's snow doesn't mean that the temperatures inside those buds are getting below 32 degrees or below 28. And we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what temperatures cause what damage. But uh, I do want to show you then the next picture, kind of uh, middle bottom. Um, that shows a little base of an apple blossom there that has been damaged. Notice the brownness on the inside of that. That's, again, that frost damage. Um, the next picture, third from the left, that shows some little young apples that actually received some frost damage. If you can tell, the side we're looking at has been scarred and kind of uh, desiccated a bit by frost damage, but the rest of the apple um, is okay underneath there. And so those apples, again, don't give up all hope. Um, some of those are going to abort and fall off the tree and they won't develop into full fruits, but some of them will. They'll always carry with them a little bit of a scar and you'll have kind of a weird puckered look on that side of the apple for the whole season but uh, it may still produce tasty, delicious apples for you. Um, and then finally on the, on the bottom right, if you look at that apple there, that's probably, I, I'm going to say that's an early July size apple there, and you see the streak over on the, the right-hand side, that's an instance of just really minor frost damage where just a little bit of that apple, when it was about the size of the ones in the picture to the upper left of it, um, got a little bit of frost damage and then just grew out of it. And so you've got that blemish that's not going to go away, but you're still going to have a fine apple at the end of the year. Okay, so when does frost damage occur? Um, this graph here, and I apologize for the kind of stretched nature of the pictures there to get it to all fit on the slide. I had to kind of distort it a bit. But this is a really great uh, chart that was put together by Washington State University Extension. Uh, strangely enough, I can't find it on their websites anymore, but I find it on Utah State University's website. Um, so anyways, it's out there, and you can find it. But basically what we're looking at here is from left to right, those pictures show all of the different kind of recognized stages of apple bud development, all the way from what we call silver tip, which is where the bud is still fully closed, but it's just started to swell and the, and the tip is getting a little silvery uh, in the spring, all the way through full bloom and post bloom. And then below that, you see the two rows of, of numbers. You see one is 10% and one is 90%. Those percentages refer to what percent of the blossoms on that tree will be damaged or killed at a given temperature. So for instance, at silver tip, at 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll lose about 10% of the blossoms. Frankly, not a big deal. You're gonna end up thinning a bunch of fruit off of a tree anyways if it sets a full load. So losing 10% of the blossoms is actually just saving you a little bit of work. Now, if you go all the way down to two degrees Fahrenheit, now you're gonna lose 90% of those buds. Not such a nice thing. Um, but notice, that's really darn cold, okay? Um, but once you get a little bit further on, notice first pink and full pink. Once those buds start to pink up and they're really, the petals are starting to emerge from the closed bud, now the temperature, the critical temperature, gets to be about 28 degrees. 
Um, but notice, you won't lose 90% until 24, 25 degrees. So, you know, a couple things to learn here is, one, not to freak out. Two, a light frost of 32, 31, 29 degrees is not really going to do any damage, so you don't need to freak out, and you can sleep well on those nights. Um, but again, the other thing I want you to look at here is the very minor changes. I mean, just a couple of degrees can make all of the difference. And now think back to when I was saying diversify the varieties that you grow. Because think about it, if some of your apples are at first bloom and 28 degrees is going to damage their, their blossoms, but others are at green tip still, well, those green tip ones, when, when the 26 degree frost comes through, it may bother the ones that are in full bloom, but it's not going to bother the ones with the green tip. So that's just, that's a hugely uh, important element of designing a good apple planting for Colorado is that diversity of bloom times. Okay, and then I just wanted to show you here, this is another chart out there. Um, the varieties listed are not necessarily ones that I recommend, but I just wanted you to see the, the trend, right? We consider there to be an early, mid, and late bloom period, and different apples fall into different categories. Notice on here they have Honeycrisp listed in the early period, and then actually it slides over well into the mid period. Personally, I don't agree. That's not the that's not the behavior that I see here in in Colorado. Um, and back again to Honeycrisp, just to toot Honeycrisp's horn again one more time. One of the things that's so great about it and makes it so well suited for our climate is that most apple trees are going to open all of their blooms within about a week. You know, from the, the earliest opening bloom to the latest opening, a week, maybe 10 days in there. With Honeycrisp, I tend to see a much longer window during which they open. Um, I, this year, for instance, I saw a three and a half week range between when the first apple or first apple blossom on Honeycrisp opened to when the last one finally opened. And so again, that's just a great way to diversify bloom time within one particular variety, um, meaning that you're just more likely to have fruit on Honeycrisps when it comes to the end of the season. Um, <clears throat> let me see. I think that covers that slide. Um, okay, now I want to talk about pest management. Um, and I already mentioned uh, the disease that we deal with here, which is fire blight. That's the main disease. And the main pest that you're going to deal with, insect pest, is the codling moth. And frankly, it's kind of nice that we have one key insect and one key disease, because frankly, I feel like it's much more manageable and it's a much more simplistic uh, strategy that you can use rather than if you had three or four different insect pests, for instance. So anyways, the codling moth, uh, Cydia pomonella, um, this, this beastie uh, co-evolved with kind of primordial apples in Central Asia, and then as human beings spread apple around the world, the codling moth came right with it. So just about everywhere that uh, we anybody grows apples, there are codling moths, except for New Zealand. And they they defend that uh, cleanliness very, very strongly. They have a really serious quarantine program. If, if you've ever flown to New Zealand, uh, you'll know all about that. Um, <clears throat> And I do want to point out, when people talk about the worm in the apple, this is what they're talking about, is, is the codling moth. And <clears throat> just a little pet peeve of mine, notice these two images that I put on here, and I call it the cute version. You know, we probably all saw things like this in kindergarten or whatever. Um, it's not an earthworm, like they always depict. It is absolutely not an earthworm. It's technically a caterpillar. So that's the cute version. Now let's face up to reality. This is the real version, okay? So um, I want you to learn to recognize this pest because that's going to help with your management, okay? So the upper left is the adult codling moth. Kind of an unusual picture because it's daytime and you see the moth. Normally you don't see them during the day. Uh, they are nocturnal like most moths. Um, to the upper right, that is uh, the larvae. Uh, eating inside an apple. It tends to have kind of a slightly kind of pinkish color even than with a darker head. Um, on the lower right hand side, that is the pupa or chrysalis. Uh, so that is the the um, stage between the caterpillar and the moth. So it's in there developing and that is typically found in the soil. Sometimes you will find them in crevices in the bark in larger trees um, or even in rotting apples at the bottom of the tree. And then over on the bottom left, I just want you to see that is a, a codling moth that is exiting an apple that it's been inside there. And so those larger holes with the black rim around them that you may see and with the kind of sawdust or, or frass 
around them. That Those are the exit holes of the codling moth larvae. Um, you should know there are multiple generations of this pest each year. So it's not like you're going to spray once and kill out the generation and then you're done. There can be anywhere from four to even, it's been recorded, uh, six uh, generations of these guys each year. Um, so let's talk about how you go about managing them. Uh, and the reality is if you want to have apples that are largely free of codling moth damage, you're going to have to spray, um, whether you're organic or conventional. It just makes a difference of what you're spraying with, but you're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to spray. So if you're going conventionally, the, the typical uh, products that are used are carbaryl and malathion, and those are both very readily available. Um, with the organics, we've got some new options out there, spinosad and codling moth granulosis virus. And I'll just talk about those real briefly. Spinosad has been on the market for, oh, maybe uh, 10 years now or so. It was originally derived from a soil bacterium that was found uh, near an old abandoned rum distillery down in the Caribbean, strangely enough, but um, it's a pretty broad spectrum insecticide that is certified organic. Um, the SID X is really quite new. It's only been out for the last year and a half or so. Only in the 2012 season did it become available for purchase by, um, you know, home gardeners and, and small farms. And it is, it is a type of virus that is specific really just to the codling moth. Um, and when, when the codling moths ingest some of this virus, it destroys their gut lining. So they stop feeding very quickly and then they die uh, within a couple of days after that. Um, I gotta say, I've been using this combination this year on all of my apple trees, uh, the Sidex and the Spinosad, I alternate. So let's just back up to spray schedule. Okay. The reality is, and again, whether it's organic or conventional materials that you're using, you're going to want to spray every week during the growing season in order to get, you know, 100% or, or 90 plus percent damage-free apples. Um, when do you start that spraying? Great question. And it's really important to, to nail down the right answer each year of when you start your spray program. So for instance, during bloom, you really don't want to spray any of these things. Well, the SIDX wouldn't be a problem, but uh, any of the, the insecticides besides the Sidex, you don't want to spray during bloom time because, of course, during bloom, you're attracting a whole lot of honeybees to your tree. And any of those products besides the Sidex will kill honeybees. Okay. Fortunately, the codling moths are not typically active during bloom. Um, but they become active right after bloom, just as those little baby fruits are starting to set. So I want you to look at the, the lower picture there. You see that kind of red triangular tent. Um, that is a codling moth pheromone trap. Um, they do come in, you know, there's various brands. They're not all red. That's really irrelevant. Um, but if you look inside, I don't know if you guys can make this out, but there's a little kind of orange nubbin sitting on the middle of that white card. The white card is covered in sticky glue. The red nubbin is uh, impregnated with the sex aggregation pheromone that the female moths give out. So you put that in there, and then the male moths uh, incorrectly think they have located a hot date. They all move in, and they get stuck in the trap. And one of the ways that they really play into our management strategies very well is the following. Any generation of these, uh, these adult moths that emerge, the males emerge from the ground two to three nights before the females do. So for the first couple of nights there of a new generation, your bait is the only sex pheromone for codling moths out there. So you get really effective trapping. Now here's the reality. Just trapping like that is not going to control your codling moth problem. Okay, I, I wish it was that way. Lots of people think it's going to be that way, and they put these traps out thinking that'll trap down the population enough. It really doesn't work that way unless you have extraordinarily light codling moth pressure. Typically, how we use these is just to let us know when did the first generation emerge? When do we start our spray program? And so what you do is when the trees start to bloom, you hang a couple of these traps around your, your orchard or, you know, one per tree if you just got individual trees, and then just check it every day. And what you're going to find is there's going to be no moths, no moths, no moths. And then sometime shortly after the end of the bloom, you're going to see three or four moths in there one day. And that's when you know males are out. 
then you can kind of count from there. You know that three or four days later, the females are going to emerge, and that's when they'll start mating. And then about five to seven days after that is when the females are going to start laying their eggs. So starting about 10 days after you first see uh, moths in your trap, that's when you're going to want to make your first application and then just keep applying once a week for the rest of the season. Um, <clears throat> so if you're using the conventional sprays, I would suggest alternating back and forth between the seven and the malathion. By alternating chemicals, it just helps you to not develop resistance in your local population of codling moth. Um, I've been doing the same thing with the Sidex and the Spinosad. I alternate those week by week, and I was very, very pleased with the success I had this year using those materials. Um, I'd say that probably only about 10 to maybe 15 percent uh, of the apples had any kind of worm damage, and in those instances, the vast majority of the ones that had damage just have a little teeny notch right on the skin that does not go very far because the larvae did take a bite but it didn't, it didn't ever get around to that second bite before its digestive tract was just ruined. Um, so I, I'm really a big fan of this, and there you go. So that's going to be your pest management for the codling moths. Just keep on it. And, you know, also if you're willing to accept higher levels of damaged fruit, you can cut back on the spraying. Maybe you only do it once every two weeks. But again, you just need to understand that that will come with higher rates of damage. Okay, so now on to the disease management side of things. Um, fire blight, I mentioned, biggest, uh, biggest disease pressure here. Crab apples are often a local host. Uh, they're very susceptible, many of them are. Um, and this is a bacterial pathogen. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about blights in plants, they are fungal. Uh, diseases and this one is not it's a bacterium and one of the things that leads to is a lot of people see fire blight in their trees and they spray fungicide which will do absolutely nothing because this is a bacteria so you need to actually be applying bactericides um, or antibiotics as we commonly call them so um, this is something where you can take a few approaches if you've got you know Take a peek around your, your yard and maybe any adjacent neighbor's yards and see if they've got fire blight problems, disease going on in their crab apples or apples. Uh, it'll also affect pears uh, and European mountain ash and cotoneaster and pyracantha. Those last two are shrubs. But basically, fire blight affects uh, plants that are in the poem group of the rosaceae family. Okay, so. Um, as far as managing for it, if you see infection, really the best thing to do is, is prune it out. Uh, you're going to wait till the dormant season, and then you're going to prune it out. And, um, you know, I know fire blight is a kind of scary name. I know that a lot of people are just rather terrified. They figure, oh boy, if I've got fire blight in my tree, that's the end. But the reality is, if you learn to identify this disease in its early stages, you can pretty much always save that tree by just pruning out the disease. That eliminates the the infection and it's not any guarantee that the tree won't become infected independently at some other time but for the time being you have cured the infection uh, but really the key and this has to, this is the same with so much pest and disease management in this world is monitoring you need to be out there paying attention to your tree and you need to know how to recognize what this disease looks like in the early stages so i want to show you a couple pictures certainly the picture on this slide is what i think of as the classic image we often talk about the shepherd's crook and so when you see a branch like this where the tip has gotten just torched it looks like and the very tip of the branch if you can see there on that new growth is hooked over uh, that's what we call the shepherd's crook and that is very characteristic of fire blight but this slide shows you that there are a lot of other ways that this disease can manifest itself. So you see upper left, that's on a, a little young immature fruit that is just absolutely eaten up with the bacteria and that ooze coming out, that is literally, you could think of that as the snot, that is the, the bacteria seeping out. Um, notice the next picture to the right, that's just a, a blossom that has finished uh, dropping its petals and it's got that ooze coming out. Over on the top right, we're looking at a branch. Now, you know, that's probably a three-year-old uh, branch there. And if you trim back some of the, the bark, you see in the vascular layer that dark staining. And that is a classic symptom, again, of fire blight. And it's really important if you are pruning to remove fire blight, it's important that you remove all of the disease, not just the part you can see. So for instance, if you have a branch and you can tell that it's infected uh, from its tip going back 18 inches because you can see that all the leaves or the flower buds are all blasted out, um, 
it, it makes sense, you would think, to just cut that part off. But in fact, the infection has almost always spread at least another 6 and sometimes 12 inches down towards the trunk. So it'll continue down these twigs, into the branches, into the limbs, to the trunk. So when you make your cut, you're always going to want to cut at least 6 and sometimes 12 inches behind where you can see actual visible damage. And then when you make that cut, you should check in that vascular layer to see if there's any staining. If you see any staining, you got to cut further back. So you're going to keep cutting back until you do not see any staining. And it's very important when you do this that you clean your pruner blades between making all those cuts. Because if you're cutting through diseased tissue and then you make that final cut into clean tissue, well, you've probably just passed along some bacteria into that clean new wound that you just made. So dipping your blades in a solution of rubbing alcohol in water or bleach in water is a really good practice. Um, you only need to put about one part bleach or rubbing alcohol to nine parts water to make an effective solution. And just a couple other pictures here on the bottom from left to right. That's what we call a perennial canker of fire blight on an apple tree. Uh, next, you can see some leaves and little fruits. That's actually on an ornamental pear tree. And you see that those little pears um, got damaged. The infection typically comes in during springtime through the blossoms. Uh, the infection needs a, a pathway into the plant, um, and the blossom provides that pathway. So you'll often see initial infections are going to be around these little clusters of blossoms or, or young fruit, and then you'll start to see the leaves uh, just below that start to get infected. And then the bottom right is actually showing the very base of a tree and the rootstock that has become infected. And again, you can see when you strip away the bark there, you see that dark staining where the bacteria has colonized the vascular tissues. Okay, I also want to strongly uh, recommend that you order your trees by mail. Um, I know a lot of people want to support local nurseries, as do I. Uh, unfortunately, I just don't see very many appropriate cultivars of apples being sold here in Colorado. Also, as I mentioned before, you typically don't get to find out what the rootstock is. Um, and just to put people at ease, I know a lot of people have the concern, well, wait a minute, if I'm going to grow this tree in Colorado, don't I want a Colorado-grown tree? You know, I don't want one from New York State. Is that going to be adapted? Um, adaptation to climate and all that stuff is a genetic trait. So whether it was grown someplace else and maybe never had to utilize those traits, it will still have the, the cold tolerance and all of that once you bring it here to Colorado. Um, also, you should know we do not have any nurseries in the state of Colorado that propagate their own fruit trees. Even over on the West Slope, the industry over there, they used to uh, back in their heyday, but even nowadays they order in all of their trees from out of state. Um, and so if you do buy a, a fruit tree here in Colorado, whoever's selling it to you has bought it in from out of state and potted it up and then resold it to you generally for a much higher price. So um, I really think you want to order your trees. When you order them mail order, they come in bare root, okay? Bare root trees, many of you are probably familiar with bare root roses. Bare root trees are just going to establish much faster and start to grow and start to put on fruit for you faster than buying a potted tree. Um, you also have a much wider selection of varieties. Pretty much any variety of apple that exists, you can get it if you're willing to go online and mail order. Um, you will get much better prices, both because you're buying directly from the source and because shipping of a bare root tree is relatively light. You're not paying to ship all the wet potting soil and the container. Um, you will also get better quality plants on average, and you can get it shipped to your house exactly when you want it. Uh, and around here, I strongly suggest mid-April is the time to plant your bare root fruit trees. And just a little heads up, many of these nurseries have a computer system where they put in your zip code, and based on some kind of algorithm, it tells them when the ideal shipping date for you would be. I have found that that system that many of these nurseries use does not work very well for us here in Colorado. And they're often thinking we should be planting in March. And that's when they want to ship you your trees. It's not a problem. Just let them know, no, I'd like to override that. Uh, Joel from CSU said, I want my tree in mid-April. Thank you very much. So anyways, just keep that in mind. OK, I just want to talk a little bit about pruning. Um, and of course, we could talk for days about pruning. But I just want to give you some of the the basics. And I also want to encourage you to prune. Um, 
for high quality fruit and for healthy fruit trees, you have to be pruning. And I know that a lot of people uh, feel intimidated. They know that there is specific pruning and kind of uh, a right way and a wrong way to prune fruit trees. And so rather than do it the wrong way, they just kind of don't do anything. And that's worse than pruning it the wrong way in most cases. So I would encourage you, I'm going to tell you what the goals are that we're trying to attain with our pruning practices and then go out there and try to do that and then just watch how the tree responds. You might not do it perfectly the fruit first year or the second year, but you will learn a whole lot by watching over a 12 month period. Okay, where did I prune? What kind of growth has that resulted in this year? Is that what I'm looking for? How might I adjust it in the following season? And another thing uh, I want you to think about is there is not, absolutely not, one correct way to prune apple trees. There are a lot of different systems out there that have been described and you can find instructions for, but all of those systems are designed as ways to address all of the items that I have bullet pointed here on this page. So there's many ways to skin a cat, many ways to prune an apple tree correctly, as long as it leads to uh, good light penetration. Okay, so tent, you're going to generally want to have not a crowded canopy so that light can get in every, everywhere. Uh, having light get into the, into the canopy of the tree is important for your fruit to size up well. It's important for your fruit to color well. And perhaps most importantly, it's really important for the tree to set good flower buds for the following season, okay? The branches that are going to produce your fruit the next year have to be getting pretty good sun. Um, also, air circulation. Uh, this is just general good plant practice. It's going to be really good for disease, lowering disease pressure if you've got good air circulation moving through the canopy of your trees. Um, spray efficacy, okay? Now, I just mentioned you're going to be spraying if you want high quality apples. Um, and so you might as well make it easier for yourself by pruning to have an open structure so that when you go and spray, you can actually get coverage on all portions of the tree. Uh, furthermore, if you just have a really overgrown tree, you're going to have to apply a whole lot more product, whether it's your conventional or your organic spray. You're just going to have to spray a lot more of it to get full coverage of the tree canopy, whereas if you have pruned and you've got a relatively open canopy, um, less material and more effective coverage. Um, also, fruit quality, I kind of mentioned, you've got to have um, uh, good sunlight, but also you don't want the tree producing too many apples because then they will be very small. Um, and so this is where thinning comes in and pruning is really the first step in thinning, right? Because when you take off individual branches, you're removing whole bunches of flowering and therefore fruiting sites at a time. So by pruning effectively in the winter, you will save yourself a lot of the handwork of stripping young uh, apples off of the tree in the spring so that it does not overcrop. And that's how you get nice big apples is by thinning when they're very small. Um, and it's just going to make your disease management easier in general. Just wanted to show you real quick what flower buds or fruit buds look like on an apple tree so that you don't go pruning off too many of those because that's important. Um, so there you go, you've got a couple of buds and you can see to the left, you see all those fat buds with, uh, with a number of scales on them. Those are the flower buds. And then if you look to the right hand side, um, you'll see a couple of much flatter buds on the, that kind of purplish maroon twig there. Those are vegetative. So the ones that clasp and hold right close to the stem are your vegetative buds. And the fatter ones that are usually sticking off at an angle are the flower buds. Uh, sometimes some apple trees grow spurs where they'll just keep producing flowers on one little compact stem year after year. Others, like this tree here that we're looking at, just make a batch of new uh, flower buds each year on their own little short temporary spurs. Uh, just another quick picture there, that's a spur forming type. And then on the right hand side you see more vegetative buds. And that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Uh, we're pretty close on time. And I did just want to put in a plug for a couple of other uh, educational opportunities I'll be putting on that if you were interested in this class, you'll probably be interested in uh, the Front Range Fruit Growing Symposium. Uh, it's going to be held on the 23rd. And actually, I apologize, I haven't updated this. It's now going to be a two-day event. So it's going to be February 23rd and 24th. That's a Saturday and Sunday uh, at the end of February. And that's going to be held in Longmont. Uh, we haven't settled on the venue yet. But if you are interested, um, <clears throat> 
And I think I've got uh, another slide. No, I don't. So anyways, if you're interested, I encourage you to just contact me or you can contact Jennifer where you registered for this event. Um, and we can put you onto our email list so that when registration opens for this event and when we put out more advertising with exactly who all the speakers will be, etc., cetera, uh, you can get in on that. But we're going to have a really top-notch lineup of speakers. We've got university experts. We've got commercial growers. We've got uh, some folks coming from out of state from some of the premier uh, fruit nurseries in the country uh, and we're going to have a hands-on uh, fruit tree grafting workshop where you can actually uh, graft a bunch of your own trees on various sizes and types of rootstocks and then uh, you get to take those home. Um, so anyways, I think it's going to be a really good event. And then furthermore, in the webinar series, uh, today this Apple uh, webinar was the last of our initial three fruit webinars, uh, but we've scheduled a couple more for the month of September. And so on September 10th, uh, same time, we're going to have uh, a webinar which I'll be teaching on the importance of rootstock selection when growing tree fruits. And we'll really get deeper into that whole rootstock world. Um, and then on September 21st, I'm going to do a class called Stone Fruits for Colorado Below 7000. That will cover things like peaches, nectarines, apricots, and plums, uh, also cherries. So just wanted to let you know about those things. And Joel, let me just interrupt. Uh, I will advertise those two last two webinars that Joel mentioned to all of you, so as long as I have your email, um, which I do, if you registered with uh, with us, then I'll send everything out probably next week, so you can go ahead and register for those upcoming webinars. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, um, I guess if if any of you have to leave before we take questions, let's put the poll question up just so we can get your um, your take on on how much you feel you've learned from listening to Joel. So I'll give you a few seconds to answer. And then we'll go ahead and take some questions. Okay, that looks good, Ruth. Thanks. Great. So thanks, everybody. Now I'll uh, get into answering your questions here. So um, let me see. Okay, so the first one, you just want to highlight them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we got a comment here. It sounds like landscape aspect is a key concern. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The aspect being the, the slope. And uh, I'll tell you what, you know, we talked a little bit about that, you know, shade and sun and playing with, um, you know, the, the shade lines at different times of the year. And the aspect is important. A south facing slope can actually be a little bit tricky because it's going to cause your trees to come out of dormancy a little earlier than they might otherwise. Uh, I'll tell you what, I've got my eye on a piece of property that I would love to turn into an orchard uh, near Longmont, and it is a north-facing slope. And you think, wait a minute, north-facing slope? Who grows ag crops on north-facing slopes? Well, I'll tell you, it's a shallow slope. It's only about a 7% grade. And that means that you still get tons of sun down there, but it means that during the winter, you will not get very much solar gain or heating of the soil because of that slope sloping away from the sun. So um, yeah, look for those well-lit, you know, gentle slopes on north-facing uh, hills. Really nice spot for an orchard. Um, next question, are there any heritage apple cultivars that work well in Colorado? Um, yes, there ap absolutely are. Um, and you know some of the ones that I mentioned on my uh, recommendations list are heritage apples, for instance. Um, and, and kind of how you define a heritage apple is a little bit up for grabs. But uh, the Shenango strawberry certainly would fit that category. Um, the yellow transparent would fit that category. Um, you know, Macintosh has been around a long time, and that's certainly a good apple here. Um, and there are others, and that's part of what I'm looking at in this trial I put in is to kind of expand that. Uh, but there, yes, there are many of them. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of those apples are really good. They tend to have some really interesting flavors that we don't always see in our commercial varieties that we're more common with. But they also tend to not have much in the way of disease and pest resistance. So just understand it's, it's a lot similar to an heirloom tomato, right? Uh, the flavor might be delicious and unique, but you might have relatively low yields. Um, <clears throat> 
Let's see, Andy Howe here. Uh, Andy is one of my colleagues down in Douglas County. Uh, he's wondering what I think of G65. Uh, it's comparable in size to M27 with some fire blight resistance. Yeah, really good comment. I just have not had a chance to work with G65 yet. And uh, I suspect that it will be a really good one. Um, and we should all keep our eyes on it. But uh, just haven't had a chance. And so I don't feel like I can really recommend it yet. Um, Did next. You want to take this other question? And, yeah, the I next question kind of is, uh, we had one, how do you know what rootstock it's on? And that's, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, it's an important question. Typically, okay, if, if a nursery, and this is where, you know, if you deal with a nursery that specializes in fruit trees, they're going to label that. And typically what you'll get is when you get a tree, it'll have two tags on it. It'll have a tag, you know, somewhere up, up higher, and that will be the cultivar. And then it will have a tag lower down, usually right around where the, the graft is, um, that will show you what the rootstock is. Um, so that's the way it goes there. You should always, if you're buying fruit trees, I would just say if the nursery doesn't know or doesn't want to provide you with information about the rootstock, find a better nursery because they absolutely should tell you that kind of stuff. Um, question is, how resistant to fire blight is B9? Uh, I've read differing opinions on tolerance. Yeah, I've seen that too. And, you know, so far I have not had, I've not seen any fire blight uh, in any of my bud nine plantings. Now I'll be perfectly honest, I have not seen fire blight in any of my apple trees that are on M26 rootstock either, which we know is very uh, susceptible. Um, and that's actually a good point for me to, to, to bring this up. The first line of defense in defending a tree from fire blight is to keep the tree healthy, okay? To make sure you plant it properly and loosen the soil so that it can expand its roots well, make sure that it's getting consistently watered but not overwatered, and you know, do your pruning in the winter, keep that tree healthy, make sure you're providing adequate nutrition. Because just like a person, if you're in good health, you're generally gonna be able to fend off diseases better than if you're really, really physically stressed. Um, let's see, does rootstock resistance to fire blight also indicate top of plant cultivar fire blight resistance as well? Um, if I understand the question, question correctly, no it does not. Uh, rootstock resistance to fire blight is totally separate. Uh, if a rootstock is, is resistant, it does not confer resistance on the above ground or the scion tissues. So for instance, when I am planting trees, I'm always looking for rootstocks with uh, fire blight resistance and then having grafted onto that a variety of apple that is also has some fire blight resistance. Uh, the next question here, do, do juniper trees near apple trees cause fire blight? Uh, answer to that is absolutely not. Um, there is a disease called juniper apple rust or sometimes it's called cedar apple rust um, which is a it's a it's a fungal disease that is obligate and it has to have two hosts it has to have a, a juniper or a cypress and an apple or a crab apple um, to complete its full life cycle but that is not fire blight totally different um, <clears throat> let's see how big is the chrysalis sure i showed you that picture that chrysalis is about i'm going to say it's about five eighths of an inch long um, the next question, should you compost your wormy apples? No, you really shouldn't. Um, probably the best thing to do with them is feed them to animals. Um, it's not hard to find around here in Colorado. We've got a lot of horses, a lot of sheep. Uh, those animals love to eat apples and heck, the worm inside, just a little extra protein nugget for them. Um, and, and, and going through their system will destroy them. But if you put all those wormy apples in your compost, you're just creating basically a nice overwintering site for them to finish their, their gestation and then be ready to come out and wreck your apples the, the next year. Um, are any of the organics safe for bees is the next question. And I assume by that you mean the, the sprays. And yes, that Cid X, that, that uh, codling moth granulosis virus, it is safe for bees. It's completely non-toxic to bees. And um, I should just point out the only place that I know of that uh, you can buy the Cid X retail right now um, is from Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. Uh, their website is www.groworganic.com uh, and you can get a one and a half ounce bottle which you know will cover you know three or four trees for a whole year. Um, 
so uh, that one is safe for the bees. The next question is, I've read that spinosad is not safe for bees. Yes, that's correct, and I mentioned that that's one of the ones that you wouldn't want to spray during bloom time. But keep in mind that once the trees are finished blooming, there's literally no reason for the bees. There's nothing that interests the bees there. They're there for the open the open blooms with pollen and nectar. So, you know, once your blooming is done, which is when you're going to start spraying for codling moth anyways, uh, there's not a real lot of risk to the bees if you're just applying carefully to the trees. Um, the next question here, how about the kaolin clay? Um, kaolin clay has been marketed primarily as a, a, brand, a, a brand called Surround. Um, and it does not really do very well for codling moth. Um, it was designed to protect apples and pears from the apple maggot, um, and it does a very good job of that because the adult females don't any longer recognize the apples or pears as their preferred uh, egg-laying site because it's shiny white once you put this clay on there. Um, but we don't really have apple maggots around here, and uh, again, the, the kale and clay, that surround stuff, just doesn't work for the codling moth. Um, the next question, we lost all of our Asian pears to fire blight. Should we spray the apple trees adjacent to the dead trees? Um, probably so, probably so. Um, and, you know, I, I don't really ever recommend that people just prophylactically spray uh, just to be careful, even if they don't have problems. But yeah, if you've had fire blight killing your, your trees adjacent to your, your apples or other pears and stuff, I absolutely would. And the time to do that is going to be during bloom. When you make these antibiotic sprays, um, you want to do it at when about 20% of the blossoms have opened. And then again, when about 80 or 90% of the blossoms have opened. So make two applications uh, during bloom. And the material you're typically going to use is going to be either streptomycin or teramycin. Okay? Both of those are available from you know, various garden supply shops and agricultural chemical shops. Um, I do want to point out something that's kind of uh, new news in the apple growing world. In two years, uh, the use of antibiotics to control fire uh, to control fire blight is going to be banned. Uh, it's already been banned over in Europe, and this was actually something that in Europe and the United States, uh, hammering out some trade agreements. This was a sticking point for a while, but the United States has relented, and we will be uh, getting rid of that. Certainly for organic production, it has not yet been determined if they're going to. Um, uh, rule it out for conventional production, but definitely organic production. You won't be able to use those. And the good news is that I was just at a research symposium and there's a really promising new uh, pair of products that are coming out that uh, are not available yet for sale, but certainly within two years they will be. Uh, and the short story is it's a combination of a couple other bacteria that when you spray it onto the tree, they will colonize the spots in the blossoms where the fire blight would normally like to colonize. And so having them colonize it first means that the fire blight really can't get a foothold and can't infect the tree. So um, just you know, pay attention. You'll see some changes in the next couple years there. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Next question is, did you say only to prune fire blight out of branches once dormant? Yeah, that is what I said. And, you know... Um, if there is a really extreme case of fire blight and you just have to take care of it during the growing season, I guess you can do that and you'd want to take all kinds of precautions. You definitely want to be cleaning your pruners and you might even uh, want to make a uh, streptomycin or teramycin antibiotic application when you finish your pruning just to apply that antibiotic to all of those little cut ends that you've just left uh, essentially wounded because those are always infection sites. Um, and I should mention, Hailstorms, okay? So normally the main infection time is during bloom, but if you get a hailstorm in the summer and it nicks up the bark of your tree, that is the other time when, when fire blight can move in. And so if you do get a bad hailstorm that's damaged the bark on your tree, you probably want to make an application uh, immediately following the hailstorm. Uh, but as far as pruning the fire blight out of the branches once dormant, that's the better way to go because then the disease is dormant, the tree is dormant, and there's really not any ability for the infection to move around. However, you still want to clean your, your pruning shears between cuts, even if you do it in the winter time. And I will point out that um, those leaves that, that crisp up on a fire blight, fire blight infected branch, um, they're actually going to be your friend in a way because once the tree goes dormant in the fall, all of the healthy leaves are going to drop off. 
but all of those fire blight killed leaves will not actually drop. They'll stick on there. Now, eventually, wind and snowstorms are going to knock all those leaves off. But late November, early December, most of those leaves are still hanging out. And that's going to be a real easy way for you to see exactly where fire blight infection is in your tree canopy. So you can go, and it's almost like little flags that just tell you, okay, chop me off, chop me off. Oh, no, I'm okay. So, yeah, winter time, but early winter is really going to be the easiest time to do that. Um, <clears throat> okay, next question is, what about planting apples in the fall? Now, for instance, um, yeah, that works uh, reasonably well. Um, I still, around here in Colorado, I prefer spring planting um, just because we have such unpredictable winters and they can be very dry or cold or both. Um, but apples are pretty tough to that. The, the, really, the biggest downside I see is that it's hard, really impossible to get your hands on bare root trees during the fall. Uh, they're really, they're typically only available from February through April. And so for me, when I'm doing it, I just, I will, I will put it off and I will wait to plant in mid spring with a bare root tree. Um, <clears throat> next question, what is the best time to graft new scions? What are the best techniques? Will the February seminar address this? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought up the February seminar because it's really too much to get into right here. Um, but absolutely, the Feb February seminar will address it, and not just for apples, but for a number of other tree fruits as well. There are lots of techniques, and depending on what technique you use is going to determine what type of year you actually do the grafting. There's types of grafts you can do in midsummer, uh, and most of the grafting, certainly most of the grafting I do is actually done in late winter, early spring. But uh, certainly we'll get into all that in detail uh, at the February uh, Fruit Symposium. Um, the next question, what is the best way to apply chelated iron for an established tree? Well, my favorite way is I, I like to use the liquid concentrates and uh, I just mix it up in a five gallon bucket uh, according to the label instructions and pour it on around uh, underneath the drip line of the tree. So kind of underneath the, the edge of the canopy of the tree and pour that in. For a tree with say a four inch diameter, I would probably apply 10 gallons. So two five gallon buckets, uh, you know, probably only once or twice a year, probably just once a year if you're not seeing iron chlorosis problems. If you're seeing iron chlorosis problems, then you're going to want to go to more like three applications a year. And something else that I found uh, the trees respond very well to is when I make those applications of the chelated iron, I also add in some fish emulsion. Uh, it tends to be a pretty mild organic nitrogen source, um, and the trees tend to just respond very well. And just as a side note, I will point out that uh, anybody who's got a maple tree that's looking very chlorotic, I mean, this time of year you could drive around and just see a bazillion yellow, unhealthy looking maple trees. The same thing works for them. The chelated iron plus a little bit of fish emulsion just really shapes them up fast. Um, the next question is, what's the best way to check soil pH and how can you modify it? Well, the best way to check your soil pH would be to have a, a pH test done, or I'm sorry, a soil test done. Um, and that can be done at a variety of different labs around the state. Uh, CSU certainly has a soil testing lab. Uh, you can get the container to put your sample in at any of the extension offices around the state. Um, but there's also private commercial labs around um, and they'll do a very good job as well. So that's going to be the best way. Those little test strips that you can get at garden centers are usually not terribly accurate. And how can you modify the pH? Well, that's the tricky part. Um, we don't have a lot of options here and this would get into a big kind of soil science uh, chemistry lesson. But suffice it to say, we don't really have many ways to lower our pH. Um, other than very temporarily by maybe incorporating a whole lot of peat moss. But uh, you're not going to lower your pH in the long run. By making sure that the soil is amended with good amounts of organic material, uh, you can create some pH buffering capacity, which basically means the, the tree's actual experience of the, the soil pH is a bit moderated. Um, but you're not going to do much to actually change that soil pH. So that's why it's so important to pick a site where the, the pH is appropriate for an apple tree before planting. Um, any recommendations on bare root mail order sellers? Uh, yeah, I do. And of course, you know, as it's CSU policy, I have to point out that these are not endorsements of these uh, sellers, but these are places uh, where I have found extremely good quality plant materials, good customer service, good prices, all those things that you want. 
So um, you might want to check out Cummins Nursery. That's C-U-M-M-I-N-S. They're located in Trumansburg, New York. And it's actually uh, owned and operated by the guy. He's now retired from Cornell, but he was the guy who developed the Geneva series of rootstocks. So for availability of trees on, on those G series rootstocks, Cummins Nursery is going to be one of your best bets. Um, I also have had very good success with um, Grandpa's Orchard there in Minnesota, or, uh, Michigan. Uh, sounds very quaint, but it's actually just the retail arm of a very large commercial uh, tree nursery called Mosier uh, Tree Sales. Um, also, Rain Tree Nursery in Morton, Washington uh, is a good source. And even some of the real big ones like Stark Brothers uh, tends to have good plants and good prices. You know, that said, there's lots of others out there. Those are just some of my favorites to go to. Um, let's see, the next question. What about protection from wildlife, both the tree and the fruit? Uh, good question with a uh, long answer here, basically. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was just out in my new trial orchard last week putting rabbit cages around the bases of the trunks because I had rabbits gnawing on the, the bark and threatening to girdle the trees. Um, so it really depends on what kind of pests you have. Uh, deer love to nibble on young uh, fruit tree twigs and you know, on a young tree they'll actually they can kill a whole tree so you're gonna have to keep deer away you're gonna have to keep rabbits away uh, groundhogs can be a really big problem or prairie dogs I'm sorry um, can be a problem tunneling underneath and eating the roots so you know all those mammal pests you're really gonna want to keep uh, away um, and you know, as far as protection, I think that's kind of a topic for another time. You'd be welcome to shoot me an email and we could kind of have a conversation about that. Um, next question, fire blight. When you prune in the dormant season, what time of year is best? Like February, March, what is the purpose of this time to allow the cut to heal or dry? Um, okay, well, it's kind of a, a few different items we're touching on here. So for the fire blight, that's when I was saying I recommend doing pruning specifically for fire blight in early winter. You definitely want the tree to be all the way dormant, but you don't want all those leaves, the fire blight affected leaves, to have fallen off yet because they show you where your infection sites are. But normally, for normal pruning, um, that is absolutely, like you say there, February, March. I usually think of mid-February through mid-March as being the, the sweet spot for doing all of my pruning on fruit trees and generally on all of my woody plants, you know, ornamentals and, and uh, you know, food producing likewise. Um, and the purpose of that time is, um, yeah, basically even when you make a cut, anytime you make a cut, no matter how clean and sharp your tools are, you are creating a wound of a sort on that tree. And until the wound heals, it is potentially liable to infection. And so the idea in pruning in late winter, when spring is just around the corner, is that you make your pruning cuts when the tree is still dormant, diseases are still dormant, but then there's very little time, there's a minimum amount of time between when you make your cut and when the tree wakes up and its first order of business will be to callus over those cuts that you made and, and heal up those wounds. Uh, so that's why we do it in end of winter. The other reason to do it in the end of winter, especially in a place like Colorado, is what if you have snow damage during the winter? You know, there's storm damage and you lose some branches. If you'd pruned in the beginning of the winter, you would have pruned to what you thought was the ideal size and arrangement of branches. Then the storm comes in and ruins that. If you let any kind of storm events happen first, then when you're doing your, your main pruning, you can take that into account and say, well, I've already lost this branch and that branch. I really don't need to prune very much this year. So that's, that's another big reason to do it late winter. Uh, the next question, what can you do to help trees already planted on a south facing slope? Um, well, things you could do, uh, you know, the first one that came to mind, I actually knew a guy who used to put, he did this on his peach trees, uh, cause they bloom even earlier, but he used to go get blocks of ice and, uh, array them all around on the ground above the root system of his trees. I think that's a little bit, uh, outrageous, but for instance, if this winter we actually get snow, uh, which would be a nice change, um, you can, when you're shoveling snow and stuff, how about shoveling it on top of the root? zone of your trees. You know, you don't necessarily want to mound it all up around the trunk of the trees, but you can just put that snow because of course the whiteness is going to reflect sunshine away and just the snow itself is going to help insulate the, the soil there and keep the temperature low. Um, so I think those would be a couple of suggestions, but really anything that's going to reflect. I mean, heck, you could cut a big disc of white plastic and, uh, you know, use landscape staples to, to tack that down above the root system in the winter. Um, you know, anything you can think of, really. Um, next question. What does 
consistently watered but not overwatered mean in Colorado? Uh, good question. Somebody's poking at me because I was being vague there. Um, and but again, the, the real answer is also kind of vague. You know, it depends. Um, here's what you want, and I often talk about the two knuckle test. Um, stick your finger two knuckles deep into the soil. Um, if it's dry, two knuckles down, or let's say an inch and a half to two inches down, then it's, it's dry enough and you need to be irrigating again. But don't worry about the top inch and a half or even two inches of the soil drying out between waterings. That's fine and that's good. Um, but really, once you get down below two inches, that should be staying moist consistently. Um, not wet, not soggy. And so I can't really tell you, you know, how long to turn on your irrigation because all of us around the state have slightly different soil texture. We've got different soil composition. So a given amount of water is going to kind of stay in the soil different amounts of times. Um, so sorry I can't be more specific, but think about the two-knuckle test. Um, next question, what about the use of mycorrhizae for tree health? Okay, good question. I know there's a lot of interest about mycorrhizae, and I'll just address it. Um, hands down, there's no question that in the wild, in, in wild ecosystems around the planet, mycorrhizal fungi are hugely important to the health and productivity of trees. Uh, for a number of years, decades now really, people have been trying to utilize mycorrhizae in man-made plantings. And unfortunately, we've had very little success doing that. As a matter of fact, uh, when it comes to amending soil or planting holes or nursery containers with mycorrhizae, um, there's really no research out there that shows any success. Uh, one of the reasons is that there are just as many different species of mycorrhizae out there as there are species of plants. And in many cases, a plant has a specific and unique relationship with one or two or three mycorrhizal species. And if you don't have the right one on there, they're definitely not going to make a relationship. Um, and when you look at commercially available mycorrhizal uh, inoculates, there's only a couple of species in there compared to the thousands that are around on the, on the planet. The other thing that we have found is that for mycorrhizae to actually couple and form that, that relationship with a tree, they really need to be present in the soil or in the potting medium when a seed germinates. That seems to be the critical window for when that relationship happens. And so I know that some people have had success getting certain species of oak to get colonized by truffle fungi, uh, truffle, which is a type of mycorrhizae, uh, but only again when they sprout those oaks from acorns. Um, so again, for our fruit trees at this point, I don't think there's really any reasonable way to apply mycorrhizae and get any benefit. Um, I don't want to rule it out for the future. Uh, there's a lot of work being done and I imagine at some point we will kind of crack that mystery. But for the time being, honestly, I think it's a waste of money. Um, okay, next question here. What is the typical age of a bare root tree? Can you buy them larger and older to get a jump on fruit production? Um, I'm sure there are places that'll send you larger or older trees, but generally bare root trees have been grown for one or two seasons in the field um, after they were grafted. So they were probably grafted and started out in a greenhouse, then planted out in the field and grown for, again, one to two years and then mailed to you. And that's going to be, you know, a one-year tree is usually referred to as a whip because it's just going to have one single whip of a cane as the trunk there. And a, a second-year tree is often referred to as a feathered whip because it will have a little bit of side branching already started on it. Um, and I will also point out that uh, the rate that trees establish and take off uh, is really impacted by the trunk diameter, or what we call caliper, when they're planted. And smaller trees grow faster. Uh, what, you know, if they're smaller at planting time, they tend to establish and grow faster, such that if you planted a, a one-year-old bare root tree and you know, a, a three-year-old tree that, that you got in, um, and you came back five years later, even though the three-year-old tree had started out quite a bit bigger than that one-year-old tree, five years later, they're both going to be about the same size. And I'd put my money on the one that was planted as a bare root being healthier. And the main reason there is that uh, it doesn't have to deal with soil interface changes, right? It was didn't have to get used to one kind of soil in a container, and now it's having to... Uh, get used to a different kind of soil in the ground or especially when the root ball has 
a potting mix or some kind of nursery soil on it and then the tree is asked to then root outside of that into a different kind of soil it just really gets stressful for the trees so again bare root young trees really going to be the best way to go um, next question uh, they're saying right off the bat we're off topic <laughs> um, are there soil webinars for soil amendment for vegetable gardens um no yeah we haven't done any yet but that's a good topic for the future so we'll definitely keep that in mind yeah it is um also just for another plug in uh late october i forget the exact date but i will be down in pueblo at the extension office uh doing a three and a half hour talk on vegetable organic vegetable garden success and i will include quite a bit of information on amending soils uh at that event and then we've got another uh Question here, do you prune for hail damage right away or wait until dormancy? Um, yeah, I would wait until dormancy. And, and frankly, just getting hail damage doesn't mean you're going to have to prune that part of the tree off. Uh, lots of trees are very good at healing up. I mean, you might have a little bit of a, a, a weird callus or scar tissue spot on the bark there, but don't think you're going to automatically have to remove it. What you do want to do right after a hailstorm that damages the bark is apply one of those antibiotic sprays to control uh, and limit any kind of fire blight infection that might get into those wounds. Uh, the next question here. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, and, oh, and how do I get on your mailing list so I can see all your webinars and seminars? So there's really two ways to do that because the mailing list is one and where you can see the webinars is another. So if you want to get on my mailing list, uh, my email address is J R E I ch at bouldercounty.org so that'll put you in touch with me and there it is uh, for your reading pleasure um, and for Jennifer I'm going to turn that over to her yep and so for all the webinars in the future you can email me at jennifer.cook at colostate.edu and we're typing that in too for you and just tell me that you want to be on my mailing list that's right and then we'll send you all kinds of you know, uh, mattress sale and, you know, used car listings. No, I'm joking. Of course, we won't do that. All right. I think that's everything. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful Labor Day weekend, and thanks for joining us. Hope you come to some more webinars. See you, folks.